Welcome back, everyone. I'm pleased to introduce our second plenary speaker for the day, Dr. Matthew Sakali. Dr. Sakali is the program manager for the BC Brain Wellness Program at the University of British Columbia. Previously, he was a research program specialist at the Weston Brain Institute. Matt completed a PhD at the Pacific Parkinson's Research Center, UBC, looking at the therapeutic mechanisms of exercise in Parkinson's disease using P PET and MRI neuro neuroimaging. And he has been a popular speaker for us in the past in terms of the benefits of exercise. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Sir Kelly. Great, well, thank you so much, Jean. And I wanna first start by thanking Parkinson Society BC uh, for welcoming back to speak again. This is somewhat of a uh, homecoming for me as I recently moved back to Vancouver. So hence the very bleak background behind me. We don't have any of our furniture yet, but um, yeah, thank you so much for, for inviting me here to speak today and share some of my research. So I'm just gonna get my presentation queued up here and ready to go. Great, so as Jean alluded to, I'll be talking about some of my PhD research, which looked at research-based benefits for exercise and Parkinson's disease. And all this work was completed at the University of British Columbia, but specifically at the David A. Mogafagian Center for Brain Health. And I want to highlight this building because it's a really unique collaboration um, between clinical care and research. So it has, um, it's a collaborative project between UBC and all the clinics, including the Parkinson's, uh, Pacific Parkinson's Research Center, as well as Vancouver Coastal Health. And I'll come back to this building at the end of my presentation and how we're integrating all this together. But all this work was also completed under the supervision of the next speaker on the agenda, Dr. John Stossel. So when we look at exercise and Parkinson's disease, throughout the literature, we see there's a whole host of different types of exercise that claim to be beneficial. We have on one end of the spectrum, very high intensity things like rock steady boxing, which I know is offered through Parkinson Society BC, you have things like force exercise. But on the other end of the spectrum, you also have slower moving things like Tai Chi and yoga. And all these things show benefit and all these different types of exercise. You know, you just did a dance session, which was great, and that shows benefit. So there's a whole host of different things. We can see improvements to motor complications. So the, the primary symptoms of Parkinson's disease being tremor, rigidity. We also see improvements to balance and posture, gait, muscle weakness, aerobic capacity, or your overall fitness. But as Dr. Lang alluded to, there's also non-motor symptoms, and we see improvements with exercise across these as well. So we see improvements to cognition, mood, depression, sleep, or autonomic dysfunction. Most importantly, I think, is that we see improvements to individuals. We can see improvements of activities daily living in most people who participate in these um, different types of exercise interventions. We see improvements to getting out of the chair, getting dressed, maintaining overall independence, which I think is vital for, for healthy aging and, and healthy um, populations. From the science side though, there is evidence showing neuroprotection and neural restoration. So the growth of new neurons or the protection of neurons dying because of the disease, which is quite exciting from a scientific perspective. But when we look at this, one of the things that was posed to me, I've been studying exercise and Parkinson's for the past 10 years and very early on in my career, one of my mentors really challenged me on this and said, Matt, you know, exercise is beneficial from everything from acne to cancer. So why specifically Parkinson's? And he was exactly right. We see that exercise is really beneficial for a whole host of things. You know, we have exercise that's improving for heart disease or stroke, blood pressure, you know, cancers, diabetes, osteoporosis, arthritis. There's overall health improvements overall. And we know Parkinson's or not, everyone should be exercising. It's a good way to really improve your health overall. But why specifically for Parkinson's? And this is what really motivated me to pursue this further. And so when we look at this, the first thing you do from a research point of view is look at animal models. So we want to go in and say, okay, well, is there evidence in animal models to show that exercise is specifically beneficial for Parkinson's? I'm looking in the literature, there's a lot of evidence out there. You know, we see in animal models that exercise can actually increase the number of dopamine receptors. And as Dr. Lang alluded to in his talk, dopamine is a key cell that's affected in Parkinson's. And if we can increase those number of receptors, this could be beneficial for Parkinson's. We can also increase the growth of new brain cells, which is very beneficial when you have a progressive disease. 
We also have evidence that it might be protective against different neurotoxic agents or different progressive natures and promote recovery, which is really beneficial. And uh, most recently, there's been evidence that exercise might actually change neuroinflammation. I know Dr. Lang showed that complex diagram of showing how inflammation might be involved and, and exercise might be able to combat that. But all of this evidence right now is in, in animal models. So how does this really translate into patient populations, into people? And that was really the focus of my thesis, was how does exercise change the brain with someone with Parkinson's? How does it change the brain in real time? And how can we actually use this to our advantage from a clinical setting? So we had two hypotheses around this. We thought that exercise will have a beneficial effect on the brain because it will promote neuroplasticity. And this has been a big buzzword, but what we mean by this is actually changing the brain circuits to improve the dopaminergic response of the brain, improve the dopaminergic system uh, as a whole across the brain. And that's what we think exercise was actually gonna do. We also thought that exercise is gonna change the neuroinflammation response to Parkinson's disease. Hopefully it will improve this long-term and actually improve progression. So these are the two main guesses we had to the questions that we want to ask for the studies across my PhD thesis. So how did we go about doing that? Well, the first thing we did was we wanted to compare people who have exercised a lot in their life compared to people who didn't. And both these groups had Parkinson's disease, but one group were habitual exercisers. So these are people who exercised through their, a big portion of their lives. They were triathlon, triathletes, marathon runners, very, very active people. And we compared to people who weren't necessarily as active or sedentary people. And we wanted to study their brains. Are their brains actually different? And if there are, maybe this is a result of the amount of exercise that they've done throughout their lives. So how can we do that? Well, the first way we can do this is PET imaging or positron emission tomography. And what this allows us to do is actually study the cellular behaviors of the brain. And specific things that we wanted to look at was one looking at dopamine release and the other being neuroinflammation. So for right now, I'm gonna focus on dopamine release because that was the main heart of this part of the study. So if we zoom into our picture here, what I'm gonna show you is how we can actually use PET imaging to study dopamine specifically in the brain of living people before and after an exercise intervention. So this is a zoomed in cell. And what we have here is two, two cells communicating to each other. And the one way they communicate with each other is through a neurotransmitter called dopamine. And for the sake of argument, we're gonna use Rocky uh, uh, to denote dopamine. Now what we do is we inject a radio tracer, which is a, a medication binded with a radioactive isotope and those two things are going to be able to allow us to image and see this visually in the brain. And our radio trace that we used was called Rakvapride. And we're going to have Clubber Lang, famously played by Mr. T in Rocky III, denote Rakvapride. Now, while I have Rocky and Mr. T fighting, there's actually competition for the receptor. So both dopamine and Rakvapride want to bind to that dopamine receptor but we can only see visual images when Raclipride binds to that image, binds to that receptor. So how can we actually use this to our advantage? Well, what we can do is at rest, there's actually not a lot of dopamine being released. So when we inject the radioisotope Raclipride, it's free to bind to that receptor. And when it binds to that receptor, we can visualize it. And what we get is a very bright, warm colored image. We get a lot of reds and yellows binding to specific receptors in the brain. Then immediately after that, what we do is we take the patient out of the scanner and we introduce an intervention. Now this intervention can be something as simple as administering a medication. We can give someone levodopa, for example, which we know is the precursor for dopamine, or we can do something a little bit more complex like we did in this study, which was actually put someone on a bike and allow them to cycle for 30 minutes. We can also do another type of stimulation called TMS, and this is something I'll talk about later, but this actually excites the pathway and gives us a measure of neuroplasticity. So immediately following that intervention, what we do is put the patient right back in the scanner and inject the radioisotope again, but this time dopamine's been released. So you have raclopride and dopamine now able to bind to that receptor. And we know from biological evidence that there's a greater affinity or whether well, dopamine receptor actually prefers to bind to dopamine over raclopride. So dopamine will that now bind to that receptor and we won't be able to visualize this. So what we'll get is a reduction of radioactivity and that reduction of radioactivity is equivalent to the amount of dopamine released. 
So what we end up with is a very pr pretty image like you see on the screen here. We compare two of these images together to see how much dopamine was actually released. And we can graphically represent this, which I'll show in the next couple of slides. Now, another type of imaging that we want to look at is fMRI or functional magnetic resonant imaging. And what this type of neuroimaging does is it allows us to study the function of the brain. And there's one particular function that we want to look at in this case. And that was reward. We know that the reward centers in our brain are actually mediated or associated with dopamine. And so we thought these might also change in association with exercise and might be different between people who exercise a lot and people who don't exercise. So we designed a task that looked at reward. And what's more rewarding than money? So what we did is we designed a monetary reward task or a task that you can actually win money while you do in the scanner. And while you do this in the scanner, we can actually study your reactions and your brain's reaction to the amount of money that you win. So what we did is we showed four cards on the screen and these cards would shuffle around and the patient lying in the scanner would be able to choose one of these cards. Now, some of these cards are winners and some of these cards don't have any money associated with them. And there's different probabilities that we would look at. So we looked at 0%, 50%, 75%, and 100% chances of winning. And what we looked at was the activity of the brain in the anticipation. So what we looked at is when right before we revealed whether you won or not, that's actually when all your dopamine neurons are firing. So we wanted to look at that activity. And it's like when you're looking at a roulette, a roulette wheel or a, a, a slot machine and you get one seven and another seven, and then you get really, really excited before that third seven comes up. That's the area that we're trying to look at, that anticipation of actually winning. And that will give us an idea of how your brain will respond in rewarding situations or how the brain is active during these rewarding situations. So we can use these images here to be able to study that. And it gives us almost a video of the brain. So taking that all together, what we wanted to look at was dopamine release in response to PET imaging, brain activity in response to fMRI. And then we also looked at some clinical functions that I won't necessarily get into today because I want the focus to be the neural image. So what did we find? Well, if we zoom into our first picture here, so the two images that you have on your screen, you have one that says baseline, and that's before any intervention at all. And this is in our habitual exercising group are the people who exercise a ton. And again, all of these people have Parkinson's disease. So what we see denoted by that red arrow is a really warm image on the baseline image in that one little circle. And after 30 minutes of exercise, we see that red, yellowy image go away, again, denoted by that red arrow. And what this shows is that there is a reduction of radioactivity, meaning that there's actually an increase in the amount of dopamine release, which is very exciting. Now, if, when we compare this to our sedentary group or the group that didn't exercise a lot, what we see again in that same area of the brain there's no real difference between the baseline and after 30 minutes of cycle, suggesting there was not a lot of dopamine released after, due to that exercise. So graphically, when we combine all of our groups together, this is what we actually see. In a specific area of the brain called the caudate, we get an increased amount of dopamine release in response to 30 minutes of exercise compared to uh, the sanitary people. So habitual exercisers have more dopamine release in the caudate, and especially on one side of the brain. Now, looking at our fMRI images or the activation of the reward circuit, what did we see? Well, on this graph, what we have is percent signal change. So anytime the bars are going up, that means the brain is more active. And the yellow bars here are habitual group, and the blue bars are sedentary group. And across the uh, x-axis, we have our different probabilities. So you can see across all the probabilities from 0% to 100%, all those yellow bars are going up where the blue bars are, are for the most part going in the opposite direction. And this suggests that there's actually an increased amount of activity in the habitual exercise group. And this is especially seen at the 75% probability. So what we see here is habitual exercise have increased response to monetary reward, especially at that 75% probability. So this suggests that exercise might have an influence on the reward connectivity or how our brains are responding to reward. And this system is also related to pleasure and motivation. So this could possibly explain why exercise makes you feel better. 
So when we look at this comparison between our habitual exercisers and our sedentary people, what can we really take away from this? Well, we know that habitual exercisers show greater dopamine release in the caudate. We see that habitual exercisers show greater activation in the reward areas of the brain, known as the ventral striatum. So can we say habitual exercise has greater dopamine function? Well, not so fast. Unfortunately, there's a number of limitations with this study. Most namely, this was called a retrospective cohort study. And what that means is that we took two different groups at one point in time and studied how they behave beforehand or retrospectively. So we can't actually say if exercise influenced this relationship or if it was just a, an in interesting coincidence. So we're stuck with a chicken or the egg scenario here. Do people who have better dopamine function um, or do people who have better uh, dopamine function because they have exercised or is it because they have, do they exercise because they have better dopamine function? So you're stuck with which one comes first, the dopamine function or the exercise. So to answer that question, what we really need to do is a prospective cohort study or a randomized control trial. And that's exactly what we did. So for the next study, what we conducted was actually looking at can exercise actually change the brain? So what we did is we, we recruited sanitary people or people who have not exercised previously. We studied their brains and then enrolled them into an exercise intervention. So the first two types of imaging that we did was the PET imaging, which is very similar to before, where we studied them before and after an intervention, but this time to elicit dopamine release, we did a technique called repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation or RTMS. And what this does is it actually excites a specific pathway in the brain. And if we can excite that pathway to release dopamine and we get increased excitement of that pathway, that means that we've actually induced neuroplastic changes and gives us a measure of the brain's ability to change on its own in response to something. And in this case, in response to exercise. Then we also conducted the same fMRI task that I talked about previously in response to monetary reward. After scanning everybody in the study, people are either split into one of two classes. One class was a very high intense cycling class and another class was a stretching yoga class. Both classes met three times a week with a trainer. They studied for 36 sessions and each class was about 45 to 60 minutes long. So after this three month period of time, we put everyone back into the scanners to see how their brains might've changed in response to both of these interventions. So really the purpose of this was to look at the effects of exercise on dopamine release, the effects of active the activation of the ventral striatum, which is what we did with the fMRI, which was our reward pleasure centers. And then a subset of patients, we also looked at neuroinflammation. And we did this by PET imaging, and I'll get into this a little bit later, but this was a little bit of a, a pilot study for us as well. So what did we find? Well, in the first image here, what I'm gonna show you is a pair of images that's in our control group. So remember, this is our stretching control group before any intervention at all. And we have one at baseline and one that says post RTMS. So post RTMS means it's after we stimulated the brain to release dopamine. And if we look at where the white arrow is pointing, there's no real change between those images in terms of the colors meaning that there is not a lot of dopamine actually released in response to our stimulation. So even though we stimulated with this, with this tool, we didn't get any dopamine release. Now, after three months of exercise, we repeated this. And again, there is no real response to our stimulation to dopamine release, meaning the brain didn't change a whole lot after three months of doing the stretching yoga component. Patients might have felt a little bit better, but there's no real changes that we could see on our scans. Now, when we compare this to our aerobic group or our cycling group, what we see before any of the exercises were, were introduced, we see no differences in our response to our stimulation. So even though we stimulated the brain, again, there's no dopamine release. However, after exercising for three months, cycling for three months, we do see a change in response to our stimulation now, meaning that the brain actually changed and now responds to the stimulation at a, at a better rate and is able to release dopamine. So graphically, this is what it looks like. So what we have 
across the bottom is all the different areas of the brain that we are studying, the caudate and then other parts of the putamen, which make the striatum. And then we looked at binding potential, which is a measure of dopamine release. The blue bars are aerobic group and the red bars is the control group. And the striated bars, both red and blue, are after their respective interventions. So I've put a star over the caudate because this is where we see a significant increase in the amount of dopamine release in only the aerobic group. So this shows that aerobic exercise actually increases the amount of dopamine that's actually being able to be released in response to the TMS, which is very exciting. So this shows that there's increased amount of dopamine release in the caudate after aerobic exercise. And this is the same area of the brain that we saw in the habitual exercises versus nons, which is very interesting because in the literature, we see exercises quite commonly showing improvements to cognitive function. And we know the caudate is, is involved in the cognitive functions of uh, motor tasks that we're doing. So this could be explaining why we're seeing changes in cognition uh, across all of, all of these different interventions. So it is quite exciting. So it also gives us really strong evidence that exercise is specifically beneficial for Parkinson's disease. Now, moving to the activation of the reward pathways, again, a reminder that we did a very similar task again, where we did the um, card task where patients could select a winning card or a card that didn't have any money associated with it. We looked at the same different probabilities, the 0% probability, the 50% probability, the 75% probability, and the 100% probability. And we looked at all those, um, and remember, we're looking at the anticipation of that, of those chances of winning money. So what did we see here? Well, what you have across the x-axis is you have the different probabilities. You have 0%, 50%, 75%, and 100%, and then you have percent signal change. So anytime the bars are going up, this means that the brain is becoming more active, where it's actually active compared to rest. Again, the blue bars are aerobic group, the red bars are the control group, and the striated bars are after the exercise interventions or the control interventions. And again, I put a star over the 75% probability in the aerobic group is this is where we saw our significant um, effect, where there's a significant increase in the amount of activation after aerobic exercise at the 75% probability. And this is also so shown on the other side of the brain, where it's really driven by the 75% um, probability again. So the brain as a whole is in after aerobic exercise is really showing an increase in the activation. So we see increased activity in the ventral striatum, and the ventral striatum is the reward centers uh, that really code for this, for this things that are really mediated or associated with dopamine release. This was only seen after the aerobic intervention. There was no changes in the control group. So we see that exercise might actually change how the brain is responding in relation to reward. And we know that the dopamine system is associated with that. So it's suggesting that exercise is changing the, the dopaminergic system as a whole. And this could also explain why we get a good feelings after exercise as well. So the next thing I wanted to talk about was neuroinflammation. And I know Dr. Lang highlighted this in this, his talk, where neuroinflammation is a new area that's up and coming, and there's a lot of research being done with it. So we thought we would also try to contribute to some of that research. So what we did in a subset of patients, so five in 10 different subjects, is we, we did a different kind of scan with them. And this scan was called PBR28. And what this scan does is it binds to different proteins that are activated when there's an inflammatory response. So just like throughout your whole body, when there's an infection or something happens, there's inflammation that occurs. Something similar might be occurring in your brain as well. And we want to see if exercise might have an influence on that. But given that this is a very new technology and we're one of the few sites in Canada that actually has access to this, there's a lot of different uh, techniques and analysis that we tried to do with it. The first type of analysis we tried to look at showed interesting patterns where you get uh, an increase in the binding, so an increase of, of inflammation after the control intervention and a reduction after the aerobic intervention. And this uh, suggests that exercise might impact um, the amount of inflammation or the response of inflammation. However, when we analyze this in another, in another way, using a reference region, which is the more proper way, we saw that this pattern went away. 
So really, it's tough to conclude anything about this. But the reason why I bring this up today is because it is such a hot area in the research right now. And so when you see people looking to recruit for different inflammatory studies or different types of neuroimaging studies uh, or what have you, these are the types of things that they're trying to look at. And it requires a lot of people, a lot of help for these studies. So it is a very exciting area of research because this might point us in the areas of understanding disease mechanisms more, understanding different interventions more, and really understanding everything overall. So for here, there's no conclusive evidence, but this is a very exciting area because there's a lot of things to really take away from this. So if I summarize everything that I've talked about today and looked at the major studies that we've looked at, what we can see is that habitual exercisers really show greater dopamine and narcotic compared to non-exercisers, and they show greater activation in the ventral striatum in response to the 75% probability. So they have increased dopamine release associated with the motor symptoms, and they have increased reward system activation associated with mood um, and motivation. Now, when we take someone who's not exercising, when we put them into an exercise intervention, we see that they get also show increased dopamine release in the caudate, and they also show increased activation in the ventral striatum. So this suggests that why is exercise really good for PD? Well, it's because of the dopamine. We're changing the dopaminergic system with exercise, which is very exciting because we know dopamine is an important neurochemical in Parkinson's disease and in treating the symptoms. And this is probably why we're seeing improvements to motor symptoms and non-motor symptoms. But aside from that, we also see if we can change that ventral stratum or the reward systems, this might help people become more mo motivated. This might help people get that rewarding feeling or that positive feeling after exercise. So it's helping on two fronts, the motor and non-motor symptoms, and it's showing why it's actually occurring like this. So really, we know that exercise is specifically beneficial for Parkinson's disease because the benefits are related to the dopaminergic system. There could be a number of other systems that are also associated, but the fact that we're showing dopamine here is very um, telling for Parkinson's disease. But why does this actually matter? How does this actually influence people on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, I think that this evidence can really improve clinical care overall. So we can take this evidence, which was done in human populations, and translate it directly into the clinic setting. And by understanding these mechanisms, hopefully will we'll motivate people to become to use exercise more regularly. Hopefully we'll motivate physicians to include this in a regular clinic plan, a part of their usual care. And what we've done is there's a number of resources out there as, as exercise is becoming more and more popular, which is fantastic because we really know the importance of it. Parkinsonsociety.ca has a number of uh, classes. They've released some physical activity guidelines. I know Parkinson's Society BC has done a fantastic job. They offer a number of courses out there for exercise and dance and, and things associated with um, all of these active, healthy living lifestyle pieces, which is great. So I really encourage you to go visit those. And then also I'll give a plug to the BC Brain Wellness Program. And this is the reason why I came back to, to Vancouver was to work with this program and help develop this program because it really shows the importance of in integrating this in. And I want to highlight this program because, again, I'll bring it back to the Center for Brain Health and really showing the in integration between UBC and Vancouver Coastal Health and bringing together the clinical and research communities. And this study, I feel, really shows a great example of that is where I can take some research findings and try to integrate it directly into clinical care. So the BC Brain Wellness Program was established a year ago by Dr. Silky Pressel, with which some of you I'm sure uh, know of, and Dr. Jack Taunton, who is the chief medical officer and really a pioneer of Canadian sports medicine. He was the C chief medical officer when the Olympics were here in 2010, and he's really been a huge player um, within the Canadian medical, medical industry. So the idea behind this was really to establish a provincial network of wellness programs for people with chronic brain disorders. So it's not just Parkinson's, but it's anyone with brain diseases or disorders, their care partners and healthy agers. So the idea here is to combine the clinical care that you receive on a, on a regular basis with access to lifestyle interventions. People need to be able to live a healthy lifestyle, have access to them to hopefully improve things overall. We know you only have a, a finite opportunity to speak with your neurologist and get very comprehensive care. So we want to enhance that care by providing access to some of these classes. So what we've done thus far is we've offered over 190 hours of free programming. And this is just over the first year. We've, we've accessed or given access to over 450 participants, which is great. 
And due to COVID-19, we've had to shift everything online. So since March of, of this year, we've been online and we've just recently launched our fall 2020 programs, which offers 24 different online programs. And this is not just exercise, although exercise is a major component of it. There's a number of other interventions as well. So there's art programs, book clubs, dance, music, gardening, you name it, and it's there. So I encourage you to visit our website as well and access some of these classes. All these classes are free of charge. Um, so please come and visit them. We, we are just um, funded by philanthropic dollars and we're very fortunate to be, to be offering these classes today. So please visit our website if you want more information or reach out. I know we're, we're partnering with a number of different organizations, so it's great to see um, everyone involved. And our goal is to really make this a provincial wide program. So with all that, I just wanted to end with a few take home messages. Um, so really for exercise specifically, if you wanna take something home with this, please go speak to your doctor, get some specific recommendations, talk to your allied health professionals, the physiotherapist, the occupational therapist, your personal trainers or what have you to get good recommendations that are safe for you to do. I know it might be very difficult to do things right now due to COVID-19 as everything is online, but there's a number of courses out there like the courses we're offering through the BC Brain Wellness Program, which are offered online um, and safe to do. So please visit them, make sure that you have a good setup at home that you can participate in, in these things. Also find something that you enjoy. The only way you're gonna get the effects of exercise is, is if you actually exercise. The only way you're gonna do that is actually doing something you like. Also, finding a group always helps. I know um, both me and my wife, we like to exercise together because it keeps us accountable, keeps us motivated. So find a group, keep, keep yourself accountable. Find a group that's gonna motivate you to come exercising. Those first couple of weeks are very difficult to get yourself out there motivated. But as the, our evidence shows, as the literature shows, the more you exercise, the more your brain is gonna change and the more reward you're gonna get from that. Also, do what you can tolerate. Fatigue is a big issue with Parkinson's among other brain diseases and other disorders in general. So if you're doing so much exercise that you can't do the th other things you love, like playing cards or you know cooking dinner or what have you, then you're probably doing too much. So you have to find that sweet zone where you're not necessarily really going too hard, but you're going hard enough to get the effects. And also switch it up. You know, your brain will become accustomed and habituate to all the different types of exercise. So you got to keep your brain and body guessing. So do things, you know, switch up from aerobic resistance, balance training, add some dance or some music or some things that we're going to challenge your brain as well. Keep, keep mixing it up. So with that, I just want to thank the whole group that helped me out with the study. This was certainly a team effort from the whole uh, Pacific Parkinson's Research Center. I also want to thank all the funding groups, Parkinson's Society, uh, BC, Parkinson's Canada, the um, Pacific Parkinson's Research Institute who funded all this, um, and just thank you for the whole team. And if you have any specific questions after the class they didn't get a chance to answer today, I've left my email as well as my Twitter handle. So thank you very much. as it relates to Parkinson's and we're happy to have you back with us here in Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, I think uh, might you, you referenced some of uh, the answer to the first one. It's really regarding the intensity of the aerobic exercise um, in terms of uh, perceived exertion level, any uh, particular uh, clinical measures that people can rely on so that they know if they're doing, I know you talked about fatigue, but is there anything else in terms of uh, what people can rely on to know if they're doing an appropriate uh, intensity and amount of exercise? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that um, it's going to be individual. A very Not individual sure measure. if you heard me there, Matt. No, I can, I can hear you. I got the, the tail end of it about intensity. Um, can you still hear me okay, Jean? I lost you there for a minute. So yeah, they were just, uh, the question was about intensity of the exercise and were there any um, uh, uh, exertion levels or clinical measures that people could rely on to know if they're doing an appropriate uh, intensity and amount? 
Yeah, so um, intensity is a great question. It is a very individual measure, so it's going to be different for each person. Um, I would be, so what we used for our study was we did a VO2 max test, which is a maximal stress test for people. Um, only do this with a health professional, so please don't go do this on your own. But it's where we push someone to their absolute maximum, we can measure their overall fitness, and then we can prescribe exercise from that. For people who are just doing things at home, I would suggest, you know, getting a wearable technology, so a Fitbit or an Apple Watch or what have you that can measure your heart rate um, and use that as a general guide. And also the rate of perceived exertion is a great scale to use. I would be, um, I will add a caveat to the heart rate is, is Parkinson's, as we, as Dr. Lang discussed, it does affect autonomic dysfunction. So you might get um, different readings on your heart rate. So just be aware of that. But in terms of exercise intensity, just moderate yourself. I think um, mid to moderate or moderate to high intensity is the ranges that you want to be if you can safely be it be in this range, but please talk to your health professionals before really pushing yourself uh, to a high intensity and make sure you are clear for exercise. Thank you, Matt. Uh, we've also had a, a, we get this question often and that is, is there any way to determine whether one aerobic uh, type of exercise or program is more effective than another? Yeah, um, and that's a very common question. And I think there's just a, a let the ambulance rush by. Um, Sorry. That's a, no, no problem. That's a very common question that we get. And to be honest, I spent um, three years of my master's thesis, which I did at Wilfrid Laurier University, trying to look at that exact question. Um, and to be honest, it's a very difficult and almost impossible question to answer. And the reason why I say that is there's an infinite number of ways you can prescribe exercise. You can look at exercise from a frequency standpoint. So how often should you be doing it? An intensity standpoint, a time standpoint. So how long you should be exercising for and the type. And really there's an infinite number of combinations from that. So, you know, there's no perfect answer and there's no way to really determine the best intervention. And to be honest, I really believe the best intervention is going to be individual. So each person is going to have an intervention that's best for them. So that's why I say find something that really works well for you. For some person, it might be swimming. For another person, it might be cycling. For another person, it might be pole walking. Just find something that works well for you. And that's why I also say switch it up because you're going to need to find that right formula. And that formula is likely going to change as your fitness changes, as your life changes. So you need to kind of find that, um, that good balance. We have a number of classes. I know Naomi is going to be speaking after me. So her classes will find, you know, sp challenge specific things like balance and, and strength. And those are all good things to incorporate together. So there's unfortunately no perfect answer I can give for this, but um, everyone's got to find the right formula for them. Thanks again. Um, how uh, do, uh, whoops, I just got to, my question disappeared just a second here. Oh, uh, the interesting question is, um, I think you referenced this a little bit, but someone is asking, how are you determining whether or not study subjects have lived a life of regular exercise or have been more sedentary? Um, because that obviously is going to affect uh, who's going to want to exercise versus not. Yeah, certainly. So what we did is we had a number of questionnaires looking at lifetime amount of exercise. And we also looked at kind of the the more recent evidence looking at the past kind of six to three months, how much have they been regularly exercising within that standpoint. And then uh, so we get an idea of how much someone has been exercising. But then we also pair that with our fitness assessment. So what we did is we did a fitness assessment with all individuals. The people in our habitual group were very, very fit according to this test, um, where the people who were sedentary were, were on the lower part of that um, spectrum. So they were not as fit. And I think you answered the question about there are benefits for someone who is sedentary to begin exercising. Uh, what if you are only able uh, physically to do very moderate amounts of aerobic exercise and you're not 
uh, I guess, uh, some of the measures that you talked about earlier. You might not really get your heart rate up that much. Uh, is there any evidence to show that that's uh, beneficial over doing nothing? Yeah, certainly. So, you know, we the evidence shows that kind of moderate to higher intensity is more beneficial, but the evidence also shows that doing something is better than doing nothing. So if you can't get into that higher um, intensity, that's fine. Do what you can do. And that's why I said it's it's a little bit individual as well. Doing something is better than doing nothing. So if you can only do a little bit, if you can only get up and walk around your block once, or you can only get up and, and walk up and down your stairs once, that's fine. But go and do that. So do a little bit every time. And, and the more and more that you do it, the more strength you're going to get and you're going to be able to push yourself a little bit more and more every time so you got to start somewhere and it's okay to start at a lower intensity thank you uh there's also a question here i'll reframe it just a little bit uh is there evidence that exercise as an early intervention can possibly slow the progression of the disease yeah there's a lot of evidence in the animal model community to show this. And this is one of the things we were trying to look at in our, in our study. Um, and this study is actually still going on. Um, and what we're looking at is disease progression. So we're hoping to show some of that evidence in the future. And, and there's um, a lot of hope that exercise does slow the progression. There is yet to be a study that intervened people right when they got diagnosed and exercised them for, you know, three or five years. But, um, it's starting to look like there's there's stronger and stronger evidence towards um, showing that exercise slows the progression, but it's really tough to say until you've done that kind of conclusive study. Okay, so is, is there actually a study happening on the effects of exercise with a group of early diagnosed people? So we didn't, um, we didn't do it with early diagnosed people. What we did is the people who came into our study, um, we scanned them and did the three month exercise intervention. And then they were asked to go exercise on their own for three years. And now we're doing the three year follow up of them to see if disease progression has actually changed over that three year period of time. So, um, yeah, hopefully that study is completing. I'm uh, not involved in that study anymore, but hopefully um, that data is coming in and we'll have some have some answers soon. So um, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I think th what this question is, is about the return on investment uh, ROI. I think that's what they're asking for. Yeah, so uh, uh, I think you've already covered that, but if there's anything you'd like to add uh, as an answer in terms of the return on investment of putting the effort into exercising and managing your Parkinson's. Yeah, certainly. So I would uh, encourage everyone to exercise. I think there's a high return of investment because the more you put in, the, the better you're going to feel and it's going to be better for the symptoms. We see clinically that people who exercise simply do better clinically. Um, they're on less medication, there's less complications and, and it's not necessarily, um, all associated with Parkinson's. I think it's associated with general health and wellness as well, but it's a good thing to do and it's a good thing for clinical outcomes. So I would certainly encourage everyone to do it and there's a high return of investment. And uh, also, I know you uh, when you were showing the types of exercise and activities that the Brain Health Center has got, there were some activity type things um, here at the Parkinson's Society BC. We've also invested in offering activities. Uh, but this question is, I think, more specific to some of the uh, many exercises online now uh, and other ways for improving your cognitive skills. The question is, what is the role of mental exercises? Is that something you feel you could uh, respond to, Matt? Yeah, certainly. So um, I think there it's different than physical uh, exercise, but there is an important component to be added there. And this is one of the reasons why for the BC Brain Wellness Program, it's not just an exercise based program. We know that there's other types of lifestyle approaches that contribute to a healthy lifestyle and uh, included in that is mental health and, and mindfulness and well being. So those are things that you should also contribute uh, and, and, and try to participate in as well, because they're they're equally as important to, to a holistic um, treatment plan. And I like really commend the, the Parkinson's Society BC for offering a, a whole range of programs as well. Um, it's great, great to see. Thank you, Matt. 
Uh, we did get asked an earlier question about how do they access the programs at the Brain Wellness Center. And I'll just remind people that we have that virtual exhibit hall and we have a link to the Brain Wellness Center um, as one of the exhibitors in that in that hall. So you can click on that link and it will take you to the uh, Brain Wellness Center. If you have any difficulties, just let us know post-conference and we can make sure you get a connection. Yeah, that sounds great. Everything's on our website and all the registration and everything is done via our website. So um, please um, go there. We also have a general inbox if you have questions or concerns. And Matt, I'm not seeing, um, oh, here's another question. Uh, uh, what does Parkinson's disease progress look like and how is it measured? I exercise regularly and intensively and over this past two years, I've experienced increased off periods. So what, yeah. what are the specific symptoms of PD that are relieved? Yeah, that's a very complex question. Um, so I'll break it down a little bit and I'm not sure I can answer it fully, um, but the way we measure progression is very complex. And this is something that's really been challenged in the research community for a number of years. Um, so right now, there's a, there's a number of ways we can do it. We can look at the UPDRS, which Dr. Lang alluded to, which measures kind of the holistic symptom score of someone with Parkinson's, and we can look at how that changes over time. There's a number of neuroimaging markers um, that can look at, for example, the number of dopamine cells you have in the brain and look at that over time. There's some other fMRI neuroimaging markers that can look at the brain circuitry, but really nothing has given us a strong gold standard of actually studying disease progression overall and there's a lot of a lot of kind of conversations through the research community about the best way to do this um, there's also some some blood tests that are, are being developed and some CSF tests and and really none of them really give us a strong gold standard so there's no clear way to do it but right now the best ways to do it clinically um, through the UPDRS so that's that's what's being done right now um, what it looks like you know, in terms of a practical setting, that again is very individual. Some people, as this individual is explaining, they might have changes in, in wearing off. Um, other people might have of uh, other symptoms coming on. So it's a very individual thing. So it's it's difficult for me to answer that portion of the question. So you really have to work with your uh, uh, clinician. And I know you said earlier that. Uh, at the Brain Wellness Center, you're looking at uh, research and working with clinicians to improve clinical care. So I would uh, hope that that's something that clinicians will be working with patients on uh, in the near future if they're not already. Um, do you Can you comment on that in terms of at least uh, uh, the um, Pacific Parkinson uh, uh, Center and the connection back with, with the Brain Wellness Center and, and um, endorsing or trying to assist people with putting a, a physical activity program in place? Certainly. So, um, and, and that's the, kind of the whole idea behind the Devin Megafagian Center for Brain Health is that integration between research and clinical care. And, and, you know, there's a feedback system there where you can get insights from the research community and try to improve clinical care. And we've tried to take that one step further with the BC Brain Wellness Program is, is taking what we hear from the patients, taking what we hear from the clinicians and trying to offer those classes. You know, we know exercise is an important part of the treatment plan for people with Parkinson's, but there's a number of barriers with people being able to exercise. So if we can try to overcome the, some of these barriers, um, then that's the, the best thing we can do to allow people to exercise. So um, we also have, you know, physiotherapists at the, the Parkinson's Center and at the Center for Brain Health. We have occupational therapists. And so there should be, you know, very fluid movement between people across all of those different options. And, and there's something to, to fit everybody so i would encourage you to speak with your clinician speak to your neurologist that you see and and ask about different options available for you um, and and then look at the resources that are posted on the website through parkinson society bc um, through the center for brain health that, that might give you some other uh, ideas and opportunities thanks matt we also have a uh, question regarding endorphins as exercise produces them, is this also uh, part of the benefit to people with Parkinson's disease? Yeah, certainly. That's a great question. And it's certainly um, involved in that whole 
um, area. So we didn't measure endorphins specifically. We decided to focus on um, on dopamine, but um, you know, looking at all other neurochemicals, all other hormones, and endorphins would certainly be one of them. And we know those are increased in, in exercise. We just didn't think it was specific to Parkinson's, so that's why we didn't measure it in this case. But um, it's certainly involved and, and likely contributing to the benefits as well. Thank you. And I'm just, um, uh, John, trying to understand your question, uh, an example of Parkinson's disease uh, benefit. Oop, he, he got rid of it <laughs> before I could read the whole thing. Uh, okay, I think uh, that's it for the questions from the audience. We do have a, a couple more minutes, but... Um, We'll just give people a little longer break time. We, again, so appreciate your taking your time uh, to share your knowledge on research on exercise as it relates to Parkinson's. And again, we're very pleased to have you back with us here in British Columbia. Have a great day.